Can you shout Jesus? Jesus. Come on, shout his name. Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Whenever we shout his name, the demons tremble. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. At the name, at the authority, and at the very character of his name, the enemy has to flee. Amen. Amen. Are we ready? We good? Good morning. Let's pray. Father, we come to you right now in the matchless name of your son, Jesus. Father, Lord, I thank you that you said in your word with two or three gathered together in your name, that you're in the midst of us. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're here to teach us, to speak to us, to give us insight, to give us the revelation of the truth of your word this morning. We ask you now that you make our hearts pliable, that you start even working on our hearts, that the word of God as a seed could be planted and that the roots would go deep within our heart. That we would be able to manifest and demonstrate the fruit and the evidence of those seeds within us. We thank you for the anointing that breaks every yoke of bondage. You said your anointing breaks every yoke and every control of darkness. Lord, we thank you for your spirit of life that's here amongst us. That you are the healer and you are the deliverer. And we thank you, Lord, that you said your word is a healer. For you said in Proverbs, your word is medicine. It's health and strength to our flesh and to our bones. So we thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen? I have a question for you this morning. Have you ever craved anything? This is not because Nada's pregnant. She hasn't been craving anything strange. No pickles and ice cream, okay? But how many of you have ever had cravings? Once in a while, I'm going to say probably about twice a year, I get a craving for White Castle. I didn't say I live on it, Mom. I just get a craving for it. You know, and the thing about a craving is a craving will be there until you satisfy that craving. Right? How many of you have ever craved pizza? Right? You've never craved pizza? Kirk is shaking his head, no. <laughs> well, hate to break it to you, but most pizza in Queens isn't Italian. <laughs> On a deeper level, how many of you have craved attention? How many of you have craved love? Right? This morning's teaching is called Craving Communion with God. We need to crave communion with God. The word crave, I had to look it up because I'm a teacher. So I had to look it up. The word crave in one dictionary, one of the definitions means to call for as a gratification, to long for, to require, or demand as a passion or an appetite. Another definition of the word crave, to want greatly, to need the example would be a person who craves drugs or craves attention. To yearn for, to crave your vanished youth. So we have within us the ability to need, to crave, and to passionately desire God. Amen? No. We should have this. If you couldn't say amen, I already know this teaching's for you. Amen? We should be yearning to know God greater in our lives on a daily basis. Not yearning to know about God, but to know Him on a personal level. Tom had mentioned that Jesus came and rent the veil. Right? The separation between man and the Father was now 
gone. There was no more wall. There was no more separation. We could now come into right relationship with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And there's nothing that could hold us back from having that relationship, seeking and desiring to know Him and seeking His face on a daily basis. We didn't need somebody else to do it for us, like Old Testament. We could now freely come to the throne of grace and obtain mercy in time of trouble. Amen. Okay, I just want to... You streamers, there are people here. In 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 21 in the Amplified Bible. 2 Timothy, so it's 2 Timothy 2.21. If it was the next verse, it would be 2, 2, 2, 2, but it's not. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. And it says this in the Amplified Bible. Are you there? 2 Timothy comes right after 1 Timothy. It says, Now in a large house there are not only vessels and objects of gold and silver, but also vessels and objects of wood and earthenware. And some are honorable, noble, and good. For, uh, some are for honorable, noble, and good use. And some for dishonorable, ignoble, and common. Verse 21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, which are dishonorable, disobedient, and sinful, he will be a vessel of honor. Say vessel of honor. Sanctified. Set apart for a special purpose and useful to the master. Prepared for every good work. The Bible says that we need to be vessels of honor. Amen? And because we are to be vessels of honor, we need to be prepared as a vessel of honor. So we can be used for the master's purposes for good works. So we could be used as agents of revival. You can't bring people to revival if you're not revived or showing signs of revival. Amen? Because we attract people that will like us. We will always reproduce who we are and what we are. No amens on that one. So if we, if we are people who are filled with the zeal, the passion, the excitement, the life of God, the health of God, the stability of God, then we will go out and bring that life to people who are dead. Bring that stability, stability? stability to those who are unstable. We will be able to translate people from darkness to light, just as you've been translated out of darkness, into light, out of disobedience, into obedience, out of unrighteousness, into righteousness, out of powerless, into power. Amen? Because we are vessels of honor for good works. Turn to your neighbor and say, good job. Good job. Amen? In James chapter 4 and verse 8, in the Voice Bible, it says, come close to the one true God, and he will draw close to you. Wash your hands. You have dirtied them in sin. Cleanse your heart, because your mind is split down the middle. Your love for God on one side, and selfish pursuits on the other. Wow, that's powerful. God says that we need to make sure that we have clean hands, that we, are, that we are walking in the place where we are not living in willful sin. I know we don't like to hear about sin, but I hate to tell you, the Bible talks about it. We can't avoid sin. We can't only preach messages that make you feel good. I can't come and preach every single week about how God wants to prosper you and make you wealthy. It would be great, but there are other things that would disqualify you from receiving those things, and those things are called sins. Disobedience, unrighteousness, walking in willful pride to do things your own way as opposed to what God has told you to do. Amen? And the crickets said amen. 
In the Amplified Version, it says, come close to God and he will come close to you. Recognize that you are sinners. Get your soiled hands clean. Realize that you have been disloyal. Wavering individuals with divided interests. And purify your hearts of your spiritual adultery. You can already tell this isn't a bless me message, huh? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. We're only on page one. Close communion with God is to become a vessel of honor and an instrument for revival. Please understand that God is calling us. He's calling us. Last Sunday, I ministered out at Temple Ministries. The, the pastor was taken ill and was, put, was uh, taken to the hospital. So they asked me to step in. And I already had a message ready for that church about walking in their calling. Each and every one of us have a calling. You've been called out of darkness. You've been called into obedience to God. You've been called into obedience to the fivefold. You've been called into obedience to the ministries in which God has called you within this house. God has called you to be ministers of reconciliation, to reach out, and we need to be obedient in that to the callings that God has in our lives. We need to walk worthy of those callings. Amen? In other words, if God's called you, live up to the very best in doing what God has called you to do. Because none of those callings happen in your own strength, in your own ability. It's through his anointing, it's through his grace, it's through his empowerment that it happens. It doesn't just happen because you woke up and did it. Amen? I can't do what I'm doing apart from my calling. And I got news here. I'm not even sure I would want to. I'm not even sure I want to when I'm in my calling, to be honest with you. But I surrender and I submit and I say, Lord, have your way. You chose me for some reason. I don't know. But here I am. I am your obedient pup. Turn to your neighbor and bark. No, don't. So please understand that God is calling us. He's inviting us to have this close communion with him. Close communion. Communion is not just partaking in the matzo and the grape juice. Communion is not some... Sanctimonious religious sacrament. Okay? Communion with God is the lifestyle of a believer. We are called to commune with him all the time. Not just on Sunday and not just when we have a problem. Amen? However, please take note, according to what we just read... It requires a cleansing and a purifying of ourself if this is going to be the reality of our life. How many of you know the stuff you do that's not pleasing to God? Raise your hands. I know everything I do that doesn't please God. How do I know? Well, through the conviction of God, number one, and through outright disobedience of knowing what I'm supposed to do and I don't do it anyway. Right? We know when we're doing wrong. We know when our ways are not pleasing God, and we know when our ways are pleasing God. When our ways are pleasing God, we're like, here I am, Lord. Here I am, your child. When we're not pleasing God, we come to church and we do this. Hopefully he won't see me. The word communion, according to Noah Webster, means fellowship. We are to crave Close, intimate fellowship with God. The thing that separates us from religious people is the fact that most religious people don't have relationship with God. They have ritualistic approach to God. They go through the motions of God. They have a very big, vast wealth of head knowledge about God. And might even have tons of scriptures stored up in their brain. But they still don't know the one who wrote it. Those are the ones that make the word of God of no effect. Those are the ones that get labeled the hypocrites. 
because they can speak it, but they can't live it because they don't know the powerful person, the powerful God behind it. The one who's able to change us and translate us and do what he needs to do with us. Amen? Are you catching this? So communion means fellowship. It means intercourse between two persons or more. Now, don't take it into a sexual, because that gets just weird now, okay? Intercourse, when two businesses come into agreement and sign a contract, that's intercourse. It's a legal intercourse, okay? Intercourse between two persons or more. It's an interchange of transactions or offices. The state of giving and receiving. It is agreement. And we are naturally led to seek communion and fellowship with God and others. Amen? 2 Corinthians 6, 14 as an example says, What communion has light with darkness? Your Bible might say, What fellowship does light have with darkness? What does light have to do with darkness? There should not be a connection there. But we are connected to God. Amen? Amen. I love you, Pastor Vin. Thank you, Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. It says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Tom, thank you for picking out the songs that God put on your heart about the holiness and the holy God we serve. This scripture says, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. What does he mean by these promises? The word of God. The word of God will perfect you. The word of God will purify you. The word of God will empower you to live in the holiness of God and develop the fear of God. How many of you can honestly say you don't fear God like you should? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And we need to be people that are motivated by the fear of God. Now that's not talking about being afraid of him. That's not talking about I can't approach him. It's talking about the utmost respect, the highest respect you could ever show anyone. Amen. How could you possibly trust God for anything if you don't give him respect? Amen. Sometimes I wonder if God is going to be like when the church gets up there before him like Rodney Danger. Well, I tell you, I got no respect. No respect at all. You know? We don't have the proper fear of God like we should because we just do whatever we want. We just act and behave however we want to behave. We take sometimes total disregard for the divine truth in his word and just go, eh. The utmost respect for people who are communing with God is that you want to please him in all of your ways. Are you a God pleaser or a man pleaser? The Amplified Bible says, Therefore, since we have these great and wonderful promises, again, the word, beloved, let's cleanse ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, completing holiness, living a consecrated life, which is a life set apart, for God's purposes in the fear of God. Amen? What does that say? It says that it is time that we get serious as the church. Amen? You are the ecclesia. You are the church. You are the called out ones. You are the called out of darkness. You are called out of the world system. You are called out of worldliness. You are called out of the patterns that this world lives by, and you are called to live according to the patterns of heaven.
How many of you pray the Our Father? Lord, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, wait, there's a concert. I'm not saying you can't go to a concert, right? But sometimes we put our will more important than letting his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let his will be done on your earth. Let his will be done on your ground. Let his will be done in your house. Let his will be done wherever you step your feet. Wherever you go, let it be according to his will. Amen, Pastor Van. Hallelujah. Hmm. It's time we get serious as the church. And it takes the, this kind of tenacity, being resolute, being unmovable and unshakable, to come into this constant state of communion with the Lord. When he says, cleanse ourselves from all filthiness, this demands that we must be willing to take inventory of our lives. Take inventory of our entire lives and be willing to remove anything and everything that God considers filthy. Some of you might have a long laundry list. Some of you might only have one or two things. As, I, as I'm saying this, I'm reminded to my father's testimony. The testimony he gives on the 700 Club. And he says, after he gave his life to the Lord, he came home and confessed sins for over three hours. Maybe your list isn't that long. Or maybe you're going for Guinness Book Records. I don't know. It's your life. Amen. W.E. Vine, his complete expository dictionary of Old and New Testament words, defines the word filthiness as that which is characterized by, mur uh, by moral impurity, that which is defiling, that which is disgraceful, that which is contrary to purity. Purity is defined as being uncontaminated. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you contaminated? Here's the problem with people who are contaminated. They contaminate others. Amen? Filthiness breeds filthiness. And that's why people who gossip always have to find someone else to gossip to. They can't just gossip to themselves. And they definitely can't gossip to God because he won't receive it. Right? So it takes two to create filthiness. Or a group of two or more to create great filthiness. And before you know it, you have TMZ. <laughs> or whatever. See, we're not supposed to be partakers in the dirt of our brothers and sisters or even the dirt of this world. Amen? We're not supposed to be of this world. We're in it, but we're not supposed to behave like it. Amen? If there's dirt, get on your face and pray. I say this on Monday nights all the time. If there's something you see and you need to just tell somebody about, oh my God, this person's a mess, or this person fell, or this per, get on your face and talk to God about them and pray for them. Amen? Don't like the president? Don't criticize him. Pray for him. Don't like your mayor? Don't criticize him. Pray for him. Twice. Amen. Hallelujah. I thought that was the mayor. Amen. In Philippians chapter 2, are you hearing me this morning? In Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 16, please understand, part of, part of what I am as a pastor, my heart is to see everybody walking in the fullness of God, which means it can't always be about being blessed. It also means about being redirected and corrected. Amen? Because if I didn't care, then I wouldn't say anything. And when there's things that God shows me or things that God puts on my heart for such a time as this, there's a reason for it. Amen? 
Philippians 2, 12, Amplified, it says, So then, my dear ones, are you his dear ones? Just as you have always obeyed my instructions with enthusiasm, not only in my presence, but how much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation. That is, cultivate it. Bring it to full effect. Actively pursue spiritual maturity with awe inspired fear and trembling using serious caution and critical self-evaluation to avoid anything that might offend God or discredit the very name of Christ. For it is not your strength, but it is God who is effectively at work in you, both to will and to work. That is strengthening, energizing, and creating in you the longing and the ability to fulfill your purpose for his good pleasure. Do everything without murmuring or questioning the providence of God so that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and guileless, innocent and uncontaminated, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a morally crooked and spiritually perverted generation, among whom you are seen as bright lights, beacons shining out clearly in the world of darkness, holding out and offering to everyone the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I will have no reason to rejoice greatly, I will have reason to rejoice greatly because I did not run my race in vain nor labor without results. Amen. Now this is saying that the Lord, the terrible day of the Lord is coming and we shouldn't just get rid of filthiness and do away with sin and unrighteousness in our life just because the rapture is coming. We should be less concerned about the rapture then we are concerned who we're taking with us in the rapture. The rapture is coming, without a doubt, and it's something that we should live. Is it pre-trip? Is it mid-trip? Is it post-trip? Is it no rapture at all? I tell people very simply, live your life like he's coming tonight, and it doesn't matter when it is. Because these things don't produce anything other than argument. It's not going to affect your salvation, whether he's coming before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation. He's coming, and be ready. Look up. Be ready. We used to have tracks. Remember the tracks, the be ready tracks? Right? Do we still have them downstairs? We do. Be ready. Ready or not, here he comes. In chapter 3 of Philippians, verse 10, it says, For my determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him. My purpose is to know him more. My purpose is to have greater experiential relationship with him where I am in intimately and more deeply knowing him day by day by day. That needs to be our goal. If I believed in tattoos, I tell you to tattoo that on your forehead. But being I don't believe in tattoos, don't do it. Amen? You see, it's got to be a determined purpose. A determined purpose. We don't live our Christian walk haphazardly. We don't take our Christian walk lightly. We don't just take our Christian walk as I go to church and I go home. First of all, you don't go to church. You are the church. You are the called out ones. This is a temple. This is a building. This is a meeting place. You are the church. And the church is open 24-7. Amen. It's got to be a determined purpose. Or it will never just happen. Some people in the church think it's just going to happen. If I just show up, it's just going to happen. They almost have this Peter Pan mentality. Is it Peter Pan? I don't know. Maybe Tinkerbell mentality. I don't know. But they think God's going to come with a wand and just tap you. And it's all of a sudden going to be perfect. 
you have to determine in your heart, purpose in your heart. How do you know you're purposing in your heart? Because you're doing it on purpose. You're purposing in your heart that you are going to live a life worthy of the calling that God has placed on you. Amen? you got to do it on purpose. If you sit back with your feet up expecting God to do it, guess what? He's already done it. It's up to you to walk in obedience. <gasps> he said the old word. Well, I'm going to say the other word, and to be committed. <gasps> he said the C word. And submitted. Now the S word. Oh, these terrible words that your flesh just hates. Oh, so much. Because your flesh is unruly. It can't be tamed, the Bible says. The Bible says you can't tame your flesh. The Bible says you can't train your flesh. The Bible says kill your flesh. That's the only way you could deal with it. <laughs> Don't play with it. Don't send your flesh to obedience school. Cut off its life source and kill it. I didn't say go kill yourselves. Disclaimer, not talking suicide. I'm talking about your natural animal instinct, passions and desires to please self. Gotta go. Gotta go. Turn to your neighbor and say, gotta go. Gotta go, 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 gotta go, go. Amen. So it doesn't just happen. You will never become a powerful instrument of revival if closer communion with God is not your priority. Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, it's got to be priority. Another way of saying priority is it's number one on the list. In order to make communion with God number one on the list, you know what you need to do? You need to remove your name from the number one slot. Because it ain't about you, baby. It's not about you. Although, when you come into communion with God and you make him number one, then he makes it all about you because you've made it all about him. In Isaiah 64, verse 4 to 7, the book of Isaiah. Anyone know where that one is? It's in the Old Testament. Isaiah 64, don't turn to it, just listen. It says in the New Living Translation, For since the world began, no ear has er heard and no eye has seen a God like you, who works for those who wait for him. You welcome those who gladly do good, who follow godly ways. But you have been very angry with us, for we are not godly. We are constant sinners. How can people like us be saved? We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. Verse 7, Yet no one calls on your name or pleads with you for mercy. The New King James says it this way, and there is no one who calls on your name who stirs himself up to take hold of you. Now thank God in the New Testament we're not sinners, right? But still, there's lots of sin in the camp that's got to go. What is this saying? The phrase stir himself up it says, and there was no one who calls on your name who stirs himself up to take hold of you. This word stir himself up, this phrase is defined in the vines as to kindle afresh or to keep in full flame. It's used metaphorically as a fire that is capable of dying out due to neglect. You see, they all recognized they were sinful. They were all recognizing that their lives were miserable, that they weren't living according to the precepts of God. They all recognized that they were falling short, but nobody did anything to stir themselves up, to restoke the fire, to get it right, to grab a hold of him once again. We need to stir the fire. 
We need to stoke the flame. We need to grab hold of him and become intimate with him once again. Or if you've never done it before, we need to grow into this place where we know him like we know him like we know him. Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, fan the flames. Fan up the flames and stir up your giftings of your callings, people. Fan the flames. If you neglect your communion fellowship with God, your fire for him can die. And you will just exist. Will you go to heaven? Not my call. Because only God knows the thoughts and the intentions of your heart. And that's what he said he's going to judge us by. The thoughts and the intentions of our heart. It's what's really in our heart. That's the problem. The outward sin is just a symptom of the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. Right? Adultery is not the problem. It's the desire to commit it that's the problem. Right? The thoughts and the intentions of the heart or what it is you're dwelling on, what it is you're thinking about. Sinful thought, unrenewed mind, hurt emotions will always produce sinful actions. Oh, Lord, I thought that was good. Uh-huh. Thank you, Lord. So if you neglect your communion fellowship with God, your fire for him can die. How does this happen? Let's go back to that first verse that we just read. In James 4, 8, it says, come close to God. He will come close to you. Recognizing that you are sinners, get your soiled hands clean. Realize that you have been disloyal. Wavering individuals with divided interests. That's how your fire dies, by having divided interests. Having divided interests. Mark 4.19 says in the Amplified, parable of the sower, says, then the cares and the anxieties of this world and the distractions of the age and the pleasures and the delight and false glamour and deceitfulness of riches and the craving, see there's the word craving, and passionate desires for other things creep in and choke and suffocate the word and the word becomes fruitless. Having divided heart, having divided interests, being on fire for God but wanting more of self-pleasure. Saying you're saved and on fire for God but going out and maybe running to drugs and alcohol. Joshua says, choose ye this day whom you're going to serve. Either you're going to serve the God of your fathers or you're going to serve me. But Joshua says, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, I still love Pastor Ben. I'm just mad at him right now. The enemy tries to distract us through divided interests. If he can, then it's unlikely that you will ever be much of a threat to him or his kingdom. If you have a divided heart, if you have divided interests, if, if, if the beach is more important to you than being in the presence of God, or doing things that the world deems acceptable, more than what God says to stay away from. I'm not talking about legalism. Turn to your neighbor, I'm not talking about legalism. Tell them. He's not talking about legalism. Not talking about can't do this, can't do that, not allowed to do this, not allowed to do that. But we need to make sure that our heart is single-minded. The Bible says a double-minded man or a double-interested man is unstable in all his ways. I want to be stable. I want to be unmovable. I want to be unshakable. I want to have a reputation that's impeccable. I want to be a man of integrity where people can't find fault in me. Because if they find fault in me, they're finding fault in my God. I'm a man who's on time. I'm a man that doesn't miss appointments. 
humble man who says what he's going to do, unless I forget, I always need to be reminded, and that's why I have so many people to remind me, to keep me in check. Thank you, all my friendly reminders. Right? And we need to be people that are passionate about walking in the fullness of God. Not just going to church. Walking according to what he's called us to do. Amen? Where was I? I lost my spot. I got to start over. How many want to be a threat to his kingdom? We're going to have to stir ourselves up if you're going to be a threat. Stir up also implies to shake yourself. You ever just need a good shaking? <laughs> Snap out of it. You got to shake yourself. Amen. Urge yourself on. Incite yourself to action. Amen. How would you like to incite a riot in the kingdom of darkness? You have the ability to incite a riot. Make the demons so confused they kill each other. Listen, it's biblical. Happened with the children of Israel. Amen. Instead of getting worried, instead of being, oh, we're going to lose. His three armies are going to demolish us. Demolish us, oh God. They're going to demolish us too. Instead, they took the focus off the problem and they put their focus on their great God and they began to praise him and the presence of God showed up, brought confusion in the camp of the three enemies and they ended up killing each other. Biblical. Sometimes we spend more time complaining. See, the Bible says in Job that we are to decree a thing and it'll be, right? Right? Please understand, whenever you're complaining, you're decreeing defeat. You are speaking death into your life whenever you complain. You are releasing and you are decreeing the thing you're complaining about. Nobody ever loves me. Go ahead, claim it. Decree it. Seal it that no one will ever love you. Life and death is in the tongue and you'll have the fruit depending which way you choose to speak. Amen? Wow. So stir up implies shaking yourself, urging yourself on, and inciting yourself into action. Question, how many of you truly desire to be used by God to reach this world? Say amen. amen. Truly? Are you lying? You wouldn't fib in church, right? You know where liars go? Washington. Have you ever met an honest politician? I mean, really. That's next week's message. How desperate are you to see his power operating in your life, in you and through you? How desperate are you? Desperation has a way of showing itself. We were watching yesterday, all day long, we were watching tragedies and disasters on the National Geographic channel. And we were watching uh, the sinking of the Titanic and the sinking of the Lusitania. And it was talking about how these people in desperation were screaming and crawling and crying. Ah! I'm looking for desperation. I'm not sure I see it. Desperation will always make itself known. No one ever sits in quiet contemplation of desperation. Yes, I'm so desperate. People who are desperate to be loved, people who are desperate to date or to be in a relationship will be in a relationship with anyone or maybe even anything because they're desperate and they will put crazy actions to their desperation. They don't just sit at home, huh? I guess I'm desperate. No, they're desperate, so they're undercover Christians in the nightclubs because they're desperate to be loved. They're desperate for acceptance. They'll defy the rules. They'll break, you know, the commandments because they're desperate for the wrong things. We need to be desperate for him. Amen? We sing that song, don't we? It's a good song, right? 
in Psalm 63, verses 1 to 2. And I like this in the New King James Bible. Psalm 63, verses 1 to 2. The heading of this chapter says this, Joy in the fellowship of God. A Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. You ready? O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Let me ask you a question. What are you willing to do to see his power and his glory in your life? What are you willing to give up and sacrifice to receive his power and his glory manifesting in your life? Take that personal inventory, people. Check yourself out. There's an old saying, you know, get right or get left. How important is the power of God in your life? Anything that you would be willing to give up or to remove from your life would be small compared to the amount of God's power that would begin to flow through you to help others be set free from the powers of darkness. It is just a small sacrifice with a great reward. Amen. Am I losing you guys? Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, in the voice translation. Now, I like the voice translation for many reasons. Sometimes the voice translation has a commentary right in the middle of the chapter in the flow of the scriptures. And sometimes it's pretty cool. Here's an example. So starting at verse 12, it starts off with the commentary in the flow of the scripture. It says, in this same way that some seek to reduce Christianity to a philosophy or a set of ideas, others seek to reduce it to a set of rules for living. If true faith is only about eating certain foods, abstaining from others, and avoiding certain practices, then willpower must be more important than the Spirit of God. But following stringent rules is not that easy. Actually, living by willpower is hard, and some might even say impossible. Paul was preaching about an alternative to a life governed by rules and restrictions, and that is a life of faith that embraces grace. When Paul, what Paul is about to describe is a life of freedom that surpasses a life of rule keeping. Verse 12, I can hear some of you saying, for me, all things are permitted. All things are permissible, your Bible might say. For me, all things are permitted. But face the facts, all things are not beneficial. So you say, for me, all things are permitted. Here's my response. I will not allow anything to control me. Amen? Is there anything that's controlling your life? Maybe it's drugs and alcohol. Maybe it's nicotine. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's racism. Maybe it's hate. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's anxieties and fears. Maybe it's hopelessness. There's a lot of things that the enemy uses to control your life. We are not supposed to be controlled by anything other than the Holy Spirit, who is a gentleman, who actually doesn't control unless we grant him permission to control. That's why we're called servants of God. Amen? The Amplified says, everything is permissible, allowable, and lawful for me. But not all things are helpful, good for me, expedient and profitable when considered with other things. Do you suppose there might possibly be some things in your life that are no longer profitable? Sometimes we get the revelation of doing things your own way just never seems to work out. You know? It's like banging your head on a beam. There's a great commercial. I don't know what it's for. 
the guy's in the attic and he bangs his head on the beam. It's like, it's like people who like banging their head. <laughs> he keeps banging his head on the beam. You know, sometimes, I don't get it. Sometimes we just repeat and repeat and repeat and we find out it doesn't work. Would you be willing to remove those things if it meant operating in more of the power of God? Are you willing to trade those things for more of the power of God? Remember, the Bible says that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. But will he manifest himself fully in an unclean temple? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think when we are engaging in sin, we are greatly reducing the effectiveness and the power of God that's in us. We are degrading our witness. We are degrading who we even think we are. Our vision of who God says we are is very hard for us to even believe it because we allow other things, other interests, having a divided heart, having a divided mind. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 says not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Right? We use this all the time for dating. Right? We use this all the time for dating, but it's not just about dating. We're not supposed to enter into agreements or contracts with the sinful world. We don't come into agreement with the world system. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not make mismatched, mis mated alliances with them or come under a different yoke with them inconsistent with your faith for what partnership have right living and right standing with God with iniquity and lawlessness how can light have fellowship with darkness God said he wants to be our partner in ministry my father did a great teaching back in the day Holy Spirit my partner Great teaching back in the day. You can order it. I don't know when you'll get it, but you can order it. Amen. God wants to partner with us, working with us and through us to set captives free. In Mark 16, 20, we're coming to the end now. The disciples went out proclaiming the good news. And the risen Lord continued working through them, confirming every word they spoke with signs he performed through them. Do you truly think that God's going to work through us with signs, wonders, and miracles if we aren't clean vessels? No. In 1 Peter 1, 15, it says, but as the one who called you is holy, you yourselves also be holy in all your conduct and manner of living. That's your lifestyle. We are called to live a holy lifestyle. Holiness is not the length of your skirt or the head covering or the doily on your hair. Holiness is out of fear and reverence and respect for God and putting him first and walking in obedience to all his ways. And here lies a powerful key. Be holy in all your conduct and your lifestyle. Holy living is nothing more than loving what God loves Hating what God hates. If you establish this as your standard, then you'll have no problem becoming a vessel of honor. And you will be an instrument of revival. Amen? How many want to be an instrument of revival? Well, we have to come to this place where we are living a pure, holy life before him. Doing away with the willful sin or the willful disobedience. You know, the mentality that so many in the church has. Well, the grace of God has already forgiven me. It's okay. No, it's not okay. We need to get our minds renewed. The Bible says we need to make our soul holy. We have to sanctify our mind. When we got saved, the justification and the sanctification of spirit took place instantly, but the sanctification of our soul is a process all the days of our life. And just when we take two steps forward, we tend to take one step back. Just when we get one area of our life in our soul and our emotions straightened out, it seems like another area the devil comes and attacks. Right? And we always have to constantly keep our thoughts holy, keep our thoughts pure, keep it focused on the word. 
because it's the word that's going to set you free. It's the word that's going to transform you. It's the word that's making you holy. Sanctify them through your word, for your word is truth, and your word is holy. Amen? Amen? We need to desire more of God, and we need to be desiring of his stamp of approval. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen? If we make that our daily goal, at the end of the day, we don't have to wait to get before judgment to know we fulfilled, and our Father, through our relationship and through our communion with him, we know he's saying, well done, my child. Well done. You are well pleasing in my sight today. You resisted temptation. You stood for me. You touched the lives of many today. Well done, well done. Great will be your reward. Amen. Amen. Can anyone say that I needed this today? Amen. Well, now you have something you need to do. You need to examine your heart. There are things you probably are very aware of, and there might be things that you might not totally be aware of. That's why we have the Holy Spirit, to reveal things to us. Not to point out, you did this wrong, you did that wrong, you did that wrong. But if you ask him to show you the areas where you've missed the mark, he will do so in a non-judgmental way, in a non-condemning way. Because he's working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And part of him working in us is revealing stuff. Revealing the good and revealing the not so good. So we can take proper action to make it good. To turn it around through his grace, through his love, through his power, through his word, through faith, through the anointing that breaks the yoke. Whatever is required, he furnishes it. So we can walk in that life style that's pleasing to him. Amen? How many of you want that? I want that. You want that? If we all want that in unity, man, we just determined today that this church is a powerhouse. We just determined today that this house will be a house of revival. If we are all in agreement with this, we are making a determination of the destination of our future that we will not just exist, but we will be powerful. And that we will be a powerhouse in the midst of darkness, generating great light among that people, those people, those people, those people, those people, those people, and those people. I'm talking about all the false religions around us. Amen? Amen? And then maybe people won't put one-star reviews about our cement. Instead, they'll put five-star reviews and say, I've been delivered from the bondage of Jehovah Witness. Or I've been, I've been set free from the deception of worshiping Satan called Allah. The moon god. Which translate into Satan. The moon god is Satan. Just so you know. Amen? God wants to use each and every one of you. Each and every one of you. You're not too young. You're not too old. You're not too smart. You're not too stupid. God called you. You wouldn't be saved if he couldn't use you. Because he's not going to call useless people to himself. Does it make sense? Oh, God's calling an army of nobodies that can't do nothing. No, no such song. It doesn't exist. He's got an army marching through the land. Right? You could do all things through Christ, through communion with him. You could do all things. There is nothing impossible. Nothing impossible with God. Nothing impossible with you if you believe it. Nothing impossible if you've cleansed yourself and purified yourself. And you're making him the main focus of your life. Nothing is impossible. And then you know what happens? Then you know what happens? Then you know what happens? All your striving stops. Because now he's working instead of you trying to do it. In your own strength. Knowing it doesn't work because you have limited power because of the filthiness. I didn't say you're filthy. I didn't say you filthy rotten sinners. Right? But sin is dirty. It's filthy. It's messy. It's ugly. Right? It's not clean. It's dirty. Right? It's dirty. So as you're sitting here, I see people checking out their hearts. I know the ones with the bowed heads are either doing one or two things. They're either examining their hearts and they're getting it right with God, or they've heard enough. One of the two, I'm not sure. But that's between you and God. Amen. Did you receive this today? Let's pray. Father, I just thank you now. 
I thank you for each and every one of us, myself included here, that we choose to come into obedience to your word this day. Holy Spirit, we ask for your assistance. We ask for your help in accomplishing what we've heard today. Walking in the place of being able to have clean hands before you. We know our hearts are clean, but we need to have our hands clean as well. And I thank you, Lord, that your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness is available for us. But Lord, it takes more than that. It takes us becoming obedient to what you've asked us to do. Lord, draw us unto yourself. We draw near to you. We'll cut away the distractions of our lives. We'll make you the priority in our life and we'll begin to draw near to you. Draw near to us. Overwhelm us with your passion and your zeal for the church and the zeal for your people, O oh God, that we may be effective witnesses that we will work, walk worthy of the calling as ministers of reconciliation, worthy of the calling of husbands, worthy of the calling of fathers to set our households in the right order as you have called them to be. Letting us be light in the midst of darkness, having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, not being unequally yoked in our thoughts, not having divided hearts, divided mind, divided interest, that our interest would be your interest and the things that concern you would concern us, O oh God. And Lord, you would be working on our behalf, perfecting us in the areas that have concerned us within ourselves, for you are the healer. You are the restorer. You're the repairer of the breach. So we thank you for working in us. We thank you for your forgiveness, O oh God. We thank you for your empowering grace now to walk according to the word that we heard today. Give us the desire, give us the zeal, give us the passion that we would know you even greater, that we would even know you in the power of your resurrection, O oh God. I thank you, Father, in the matchless name of Jesus. Now, if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, if you just raise your hand, I'll be more than honored to pray with you, to lead you into a right relationship with the Father. Is there anyone here? Maybe you're watching by way of Ustream, and you, maybe you go to church, but you don't understand this whole relationship and communion with God that I've talked about. Well, it is real, and it is a possibility. If you would just pray this prayer with me, understanding that Jesus loves you, and he desires to know you, but more importantly, he desires for you to know him. If you just say this prayer, he will honor this prayer and he will come and take residence up in your heart and you will become a child of God. You will become born again. Just repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you as I am, a sinner. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge you died on a cross for me. You were buried in a tomb and rose again for the forgiveness of my sin and for the restoration of my relationship with God. I invite you into my heart. Fill me with your power. Fill me with your presence. Fill me with your grace and your ability. Give me the desire to know you. Thank you for forgiving my sins and making me your child. In Jesus' name I pray and I thank you. Amen and amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, if you've prayed that prayer, I got good news for you. Today's the first day of the rest of your life. I know that sounds like a cliche, but it's true. Every sin that you've ever committed at this moment, he has taken and has cleansed you. The record is clean. Today, you are brand new. I want to encourage you to get in your Bible and start reading a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, I'll be more than happy to send you one. Find yourself a good Bible teaching church. If you don't have one, I'll be more than happy to help you locate one. If you're in the Flushing area, Flushing, Queens, come on out. We'd love to meet you. Be part here. You're more than welcome to come. Amen? Why don't we give the Lord a shout? Thank you for watching. See you next week. Amen? Hallelujah. Did you